Adam Smith thought, who's the originator or has been ascribed to as the, the creator of, of um, capitalism, said that, you know, once the cup is full, it will flow out and other people will get enough and so everyone will get taken care of. And it was a myth. You know, that is true if you're nice enough. But we ain't that nice. We haven't got there in evolutionary terms yet. Adam Smith may personally have been more evolved and said, well, that's what people in the top level, the interdependent level, are beginning to do. The trouble is we're not there yet. So that, our system that was designed on that basis just simply doesn't work. So the pretense that capitalism works is, is it's based on a false premise in the first place. It just doesn't work. It's a rotten system. Ca communism was a rotten system and it failed. Capitalism is a rotten system and it's failed. Let's be honest about it. What we have is an economy that people are in service to. You know, what happens is, you know, the banks, whatever it is, you know, they get into financial trouble. So what do they do? They lay off loads of people. You know, the top people in the bank still take home their, their, their millions and that sort of thing. But they lay off lots of people. In other words, that it's, it's the people is not the first consideration. The money is the first consideration. We have these coins and things. They're just part of an exchange system. That's the purpose of it, is to enable to, us to exchange goods and services. But the money has become the goal in itself. It's a complete distortion of trade. As coaches, we're sometimes working with companies and you want them to have a, a, you know, a fundamental change in their, in their management culture towards a, mo a coaching culture, so we say, in an organization. So you go in and you do your stuff and the culture changes by 10%. And you feel, oh, well, you've had a bit of success. But actually, what happens is the company now settles down and says, oh, well, we've made our change. We don't have to do anything more. So, you know, there is an, an argument that to say, either you change all the way or I won't work with you. And if they don't want to change fundamentally about how they do everything, how they treat people, how they treat, treat their customers, all the things we're talking about, if they're not willing to do that, goodbye. Give me a call when you wake up. And just in relation to that, in absolute terms, you know, we've got all this stuff going on about the environment at the moment. In absolute terms, nothing has been, nothing has changed. You know, we're doing all this, you know, lots of things in the papers, all the newspapers like The Independent and everything, they've got green articles and green supplements, and we're doing this, and we're doing this, and the result is zero so far. When, when we're coaches, we're looking at whose agenda are we on. Now, what I'm saying is that there's a hierarchy of... Um, a hierarchy of, shall we say, values. You know, I will be on the client's agenda, but if that client's agenda clashes with my values, do I continue on the client's agenda? And what I would say is that there's a hierarchy of values. And I'm just throwing this out there for you to think about as a coach. You know, at what point do you say what you're asking me to coach you on or to improve in your organization transgresses my values and I'm not going to support you going in that direction? Now, you can do that by asking other questions, well, what if, or what about, or how does that affect your suppliers in Indonesia, or whatever it is, there are ways of going there. But again, you need to be able to go outside the box, and you need to have the knowledge to be able to ask those, those questions that are gonna cause them to think that may bring, you, bring them up to the kind of values that you espouse and that you want. The boundary between them and us, and this is, a, a way of explaining sort of ex consciousness expansion. And if we start here with the, um, the child when they're first born, they're only interested in themselves. And that's perfectly reasonable. I mean, they, if, they're, if they're uncomfortable or hungry or whatever it is, they scream until mum helps, yeah? And so the self-interest is there, and that's absolutely necessary for a young child. And as the person begins to grow up, they begin to include more in what they call us. And that would be their pop stars, their celebrities, their football teams, and that sort of thing become part of us, you know, or their village locally, or whatever it may be. 
the sort of geographical content of what, can, what is us. And then outside that is them. And what we're really trying to do and what, what we have to do in this world is to keep people's consciousness, our own and other people's consciousness, expanding so that we begin to include more and more in us until we get out to everything there is, is us. So that's the very egocentric, um, small vision, shall we say. And then we get to the second one, the ethnocentric one, which is, shall we say, tribal. And that is often classified as sort of adolescent kind of way, kind of way of seeing things. And uh, if we're honest about it, much of our society is in this level. And I would say this is where, uh, you know, the whole capitalist system is ethnocentric. It's a tribal my tribe is better than your tribe game. And so the, the whole economic system we have and the structural system we have actually keeps us in that tribal consciousness. And it, it, it has to go. It has to go. We will not survive if we stay in that tribal consciousness. I don't think anyone could have the title, deserves the title of a leader until they have become world-centric in their consciousness. This is a question from Finland, from Tina Harmia. Sir John, while you've been working with organisations, have you noticed different value systems among new generations, for example, Generation Y or Generation MeWe? <laughs> um, uh, the, answer, the short answer is yes. And I work, at a lot of, uh, I work in a lot of different countries, and I see it in different countries. Um, I think that uh, there, there is a a younger generation that, that, that I have a lot of hope with. I think a lot of the, the younger people, and I think there are two stages of this, I think there are um, young 14-year-olds uh, who introduce their parents to the environment because their parents hadn't come across it before, but their children had at school or whatever it is, and that's the thing. I've heard of a lot of people say, it was my children that first got me involved in the environment. But I think there's another stage of that, and that's the sort of 25 to 35-year-old people who I'm very impressed by. I'm very impressed by. We can read in the newspapers about, you know, wayward youth and that sort of thing, but I'm very impressed by those younger people. They often have very much higher values than the, than the heads of the corporations they work for and, and that sort of thing. And, and that creates a problem because you've got an inversion, in fact, in terms of values. The, the heads of the corporation are still buying their 4 by 4s and 400 horsepower to take their children a few hundred yards to school and that sort of thing, and the young people don't want that. So John, do you really believe we have got time enough for a slow revolution through coaching? <laughs> uh, wonderful question, thank you. Um, uh, the answer is yes and no, in, in my opinion. And that is why I say yes, is that I think we do everything we possibly can because there's nothing better to do than to do everything you possibly can. And you get a lot of fulfillment out of doing everything you possibly can. Do I think that if all of us did everything we possibly can, at the present rate of progress, we are going to actually save the planet? Frankly, no. But we've got some help. We've got some help. And the help is the breakdown that we have just seen in the economic field. The increasing number, I don't know whether you've seen the statistics, but back in Fortune magazine in 2001, they gave statistics about the major events that were breakdown events that are occurring. It has gone up from about 40 a year from the beginning of the last century to 400 or more a year now. And these are everything from tsunamis to HIV to economic crises, earthquakes and everything. There's a whole lot of crises going on. That is a wake-up call. You can't deny the fact that these major events are taking place, and one of them has just taken place. And I believe a combination of all our efforts together, plus these inevitable events anyway, we, we will actually scrape through. I believe it. I prefer to be an optimist, because optimists have a better life anyway, I'm told. <laughs> so that's what I am.